If you thought my 78 natural flame top custom was good, wait till you see what's in this box. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Man, I gotta stop opening these emails from Carter Vintage. So a couple of months back, I received a message from one of the employees there that in one of my videos, I had said I was looking for a very historic guitar, and they just happened to get it in. And I'm not ready to share that mystery guitar with you guys yet, but about three months later, I get an email about this thing, and I knew if I didn't get it, I would regret it the rest of my life. This is the craziest 20th anniversary Les Paul custom you guys are ever, ever going to see. <laughs> Look at this top, my friends. And the story behind this one, even though it's not 100% verifiable, is pretty cool. So I think we're going to share it too. But let's go ahead and get this beauty out. Okay, so here she is. Look at the travel on <laughs> Like, if you don't realize why I'm hackling like a hyena over here, you might not understand Gibson Les Paul history. To find a top like this today, it would just be relatively difficult. You could eventually find it. But to find a top like this in 1974, it is just so absolutely unheard of. And then I haven't even shown you the back of this thing yet. We've got a flamed maple neck. So to fully understand this, I need to teach you a little bit more about these things. And we're going to start with this being a 20th anniversary Les Paul Custom. So, 1954, Les Paul Customs, they looked like this. Technically, they were introduced in late 53. But for all intents and purposes, let's call it 54 because 1974 is when they did the 20th anniversary. So Customs from about 54 through 57, they had the Alnico 5 staple pickup. And then eventually we move into the humbuckers. And by 6061, the Les Paul body shape that we're looking at here was discontinued in favor for the SG. And then the Customs and Standards, they didn't come back until 1968. And that's right around the time that Norlin Industries took over Gibson. Very interesting things happened in the Norlin era. They are not well known for being the most highly specced out guitars, but they are well known for change. So we start to get the introduction of volutes, pancake bodies. We shorten the neck tenon. And even more changes happen after 1975 when the Nashville shop shows up. But we're not going to touch too much on that in this episode. If you need to learn more about that, check out this episode. So in 1974, even though there was a divorce of like eight years, they decided to celebrate the 20th anniversary. And this is one of the earliest anniversary guitars that Gibson did. And it's pretty lame. All they did was this 20th anniversary inlay at the 15th fret. And if you use steel wool, you can accidentally erase that off the inlay. So that's kind of lame, but they did introduce some new colors. The most common ones you'll find are Alpine White, Cherry Sunburst, Ebony, and Wine Red. This was the very first year for Alpine White. But most of them would look like this one. Here's a very nice, beautiful tobacco sunburst. You would have a three-piece maple top. Sometimes you would get lucky and get some flames. I call this particular one my bearded lady because two sides have flame. The other one's just plain, but it's cool in its own right. But these guys had a pancake body construction, which is two pieces of mahogany. And then you've got a maple layer in between, which was technically more labor intensive to produce, but they could use smaller mahogany slabs in order to create these bodies. And you would have a mahogany neck on these. Some other key characteristics include having the golden waffle back tuners. These are still Kalamazoo made, so they've got the bone nut, they've got the really tiny frets that some guys like and or don't like. But this is what you normally expect these things to look like. So now we got this oddball over here. Let's talk finish here first. Was natural in that list? No. If you search 20th anniversary natural Les Paul custom, will you find some results? Yes, but generally they're refinished. I'm not going to say this is the only natural Les Paul custom birthed in the early 70s but there were very few. Natural starts to become much more common in 1976. And I'm sure you can find some in 75 too. Sometimes it's just a, a slow transition into what you need to get. So it's hard to pinpoint an exact year due to, was it late in the year, earlier in the year? So that means it's technically a custom color. There you go, double the price. And then the other obvious elephant in the room here is the ridiculous flame top. You don't see this in this era, let alone it being a two piece top. That makes it incredibly special. Occasionally you'll find a special one piece top, but honestly, this is just so insane. I, I don't even care. I actually prefer that it's a two piecer. So there you go, double the price again. But then if you remember correctly, I said these guys had mahogany necks. Gibson starts to use maple necks around 1975. So a true 74 should not have a maple neck yet in a Les Paul Custom. So that makes it a little bit special, 
but hold the phone here. You can actually find a good handful of 20th anniversary Les Paul customs that do have the maple neck simply because they used this inlay in 1974 and they had a lot to use up still in 75. I've actually seen one as late as 1976 that still had the inlay. Sometimes they just had stuff they were going to use it up, they weren't going to waste it. This is the Norlin era. So while definitely being a very unique spec to this one and probably one of the most spectacular flame necks that you'll see in this era, it's not necessarily a 100% unique characteristic. In fact, to be completely honest, I won't be surprised if the pot codes on this actually date to 1975 and that this was potentially a later made one and that's why it has the maple neck but that's just what we're gonna have to find out together but the other miraculous thing about this one is the fact that it's nearly mint condition it's aged it's not completely stark white binding like i'm scared this thing has been refinished or something it's just been lovingly well cared for so now we need to talk about the story of this one because special finish special top special neck and in case you missed it this is a special case most 1974 75-ish cases actually have a purple interior this is more like the modern day custom shop maroon i noticed this when the carter vintage guys were sending me photos because otherwise i was going to get it like an original artist series case because that would look great in this but then they told me the tale full disclosure there is no way to verify this at all however the person who can sign this with the shop has owned it since the 90s and the person that he purchased it for says this guitar was originally made for George Harrison in a set. You know, Gibson was trying to win him over, get him some really cool guitars. So they sent him this absolutely gorgeous natural Les Paul Custom and this one, a Brazilian Rosewood Les Paul Custom with a 20th anniversary inlay. Now, isn't it cool that I have both of those exact guitars here and the Yeti happened to just be that guitar? Nah, just kidding. <laughs> it's not. This one does not have the 20th anniversary inlay on it, but I have seen a few Brazilian Rosewood Top Customs that do. These are rare in and of themselves. There's only like approximately 50 of them out there. If you need to learn about my Yeti here, you can check out this episode. So that's quite a tale, right? But it kind of makes sense because George Harrison Rosewood Telecaster. So maybe they would try to win him over with a Rosewood Les Paul Custom that was a little bit lighter, or a beautiful flame maple one, hey, we can actually make him look good. So the only reason I bring that story up is, who knows, maybe Paul McCartney might see this video and go, oh yeah, I remember that guitar. Because this is a guitar, I don't care who you are, you would remember this the rest of your life if you saw this thing in person. But short of him, maybe one of his managers, or somebody that worked with him at one point in time, maybe a stagehand, or a concert goer might remember remember this from one weird show that they just happen to have this old Polaroid from? It's probably not true. But if it is true, I think it would be kind of cool. But I've already doubled the price tag on this thing too many times, so I did not pay any premium for that. I just bought it because, hey, that is the best 20th anniversary custom I've ever seen. And the only physical proof I have to back this story up comes in the case over here, where we've got some original case candy here. You would get this on late 60s and early 70s Les Pauls. I mean, these things sell for about 100 bucks themselves. But I was curious if it got filled out at the end, because there is a warranty page. And it does not look like it was ever filled in and sent out. So that's a non-lead here, but I've got something else in my hand. This looks like an original hang tag from a store. It makes mention of a rosewood top and a maple top. Now, maple top isn't necessarily special, but you're not going to write maple top on one unless it's really special like this guy. And unfortunately, we only have one of the serial numbers, and it's supposedly for the rosewood top one. So if you own serial 406358, I'd be real curious. Did you get fed a similar story? So to learn more about this masterpiece, let's throw it on the workbench and take a look at its parts and specs. Don't even ask me about this one. Not for sale. Ever. Period. Go away. <laughs> Unless you've got a million dollars. I haven't been nervous to take a guitar apart in a while, but this one, d definitely a little nerve wracking being as clean as it is. You don't want to ruin everything. So I've taken a lot of precautions on this particular one. But let's go ahead and learn about early to mid 70s Les Paul Customs. The pickups within this era are known as T-tops. Now when this particular guitar was produced, which I'm guessing really is somewhere in 1975, despite what our inlay's telling us, this is exactly the time when the patent number engravings in the bottom of your T-tops come into play. This is just before they start putting ink stamp dates on them. So we're transitioning away from the water slide decals. Now typically the water slide decal T-tops are worth a little bit more than the later ones simply because 
there were less of those made as compared to this. But our bridge pickup looks exactly the same. But I thought these solder joints looked newer, which made me think, did somebody replace the pickup covers? So then I took a look at the pickup rings to see what markings we have here, because I'm lucky, I actually have another 1975 20th anniversary Les Paul Custom here. So I was able to cross check it, and yeah, the solder joints are very shiny on these, so it's probably stock. But as far as the pickups themselves, they're about the same. You get 7k ohms in our bridge position, 7.19 in the neck, and our middle just for fun here, 3.5. But now let's check out the cavities. So this is how early 70s Les Pauls are constructed. This is when the long neck tenon starts to go away, but they still route the body out for this. So technically, this is a short neck tenon with the long route. However, since it does stick out just a tad, I think this one would still technically be considered transitional. Sometimes you can actually find some cool date stamps on these necks. But unfortunately, not on this one. Then in our bridge pickup cavity, you can see some more of the same stuff. Unfortunately, no markings, George Harrison, or anything like that. But you're going to notice another maple layer right here. So you can see the maple layer right here on the body, but right here in the thin binding in the cutaway, you can see that additional layer before you get to the maple top. Now, if you don't want to hear bad things about this guitar, click off the video now. <laughs> it wasn't big enough to be a center seam. I did not notice this until I went to film the B-roll. The center seam is really off, but not only is it off, it runs at a diagonal just to kind of make it look like it does have the center seam. But if you look where it should line up with the strap button to be the center, it is way off. But they're probably like, this wood we got is so nice, we can't let this go to waste. However, I'm not too upset about it. I really like this weird triangle of figuring that they've got going on here. And I'm typically a pick guard on kind of guy, but when I took this off, oh my. This is the one part on the body that I consider is actually quilt. Because this is one of those tops where you're like, is it a quilt top? Is it a flame top? It's kind of a combination of both. However, ultimately, I think it's a wide flame in my opinion, but it's right here where it gets so tight that I would probably say it's more so quilt. But it has like this long dark mineral streak line right here, which I think looks cool, but I can understand why they covered it up with a pick guard too. My favorite thing about this top besides the figuring is this squiggly wood grain that it's got going on through the whole thing. I love that. In the 80s, a lot of times you'll find cross-hatched wood grain where the wood grain will go up and down and then you got like pinstripey flame running this way. I've always thought that was a pretty fascinating concept. But to have this one with all the waviness and you can see it in the pickup cavities too. That way you know it's not just a veneer. So with this one being born in 75, that's when Nashville starts to open up. That's when a lot of changes are going to happen. Again, check out that video that I talked about. But this one still has the true ABR1 bridge and is a Kalamazoo built. But this bridge is very clean. Still has the retaining wire and the Gibson branding back here. Here's our tailpiece. Looks exactly the way we would want it to. Then this is the era of the witch hat knobs, as they call them. But you do have the pointers right there that tell you where you are. Affectionately called thumb bleeders, because if you're not careful, they might slice your thumb. But that's just two volumes and two tones. But let's move on to our maple neck with our ebony fretboard. We already learned about the inlay, but I really want you to take a look at these frets. You see how skinny they are? Once Nashville starts to open, the frets get wider, but they do not get much taller. These style frets are much closer to what the fretless wonders originally were. But it's my understanding those ones were even smaller. But that's how tall the frets are, and that's how wide they are, as compared to a later Nashville custom. We get 1.7 inches at the nut. 2.05 by the 12th. First fret neck up, 0.81. And 0.97 by the 12th. Here's that neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. This neck has a nice C shape to it. It doesn't have a lot of shoulder, but it's pretty rounded. It's a little bit thicker than what you normally run into in this era. It's still a 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length with a 12 inch fretboard radius. And we've still got a bone nut. That's something that starts to change very soon after this. So normally we would see a mahogany neck back here, but again, changes are starting to happen and I think this one was special. But our truss rod's in perfect shape and the lacquer is surprisingly hardly aged at all. Normally, if your lacquer here has yellowed, the lacquer there would also yellow. But it might be that not a lot of yellowing has actually occurred and this is like the true color of the binding. 
Because if you need to know what color your binding actually is, look right here on the fretboard. This top area does not have any clear coat over top of it, and it is a yellow color. Whereas if you go look on a Black Widow Les Paul, you can see it's a cream color, and then it's just been painted over red. So even though seeing this makes me go, ha, huh, what's going on there? It does explain itself. Moving on to the back now, I might have found something. You can see the pots have all the oxidization on them, the white dust as it's called. But it looks like this pot actually still has a readable pot code, and it's the 30th week of 1974. So that's the very, very earliest that this guitar could have been made. But since we have a readable 1974, I'm actually going to call this a 74. But no, do you see what I see right here? A big G. Does it stand for George? <laughs> that might be a stretch. But it is cool to see all that wood grain on the backside as well. And you can see our ground wire, pancake body, all that good stuff. And I'm not seeing any obvious signs of refinishing. This looks like a Gibson quality job to me. It feels like it. Future Trogly, if you're watching this video, trying to see how much damage you put on this thing over the years. I mean, you got a couple of light scratches over here. There's like some weird unevenness to the wood right here, where it's just kind of like bunched up a bit because it wasn't sanded flush or something. And maybe some light scratches but here's what our toggle switch cavity looks like. Pretty much more of the same. I didn't see any crazy markings in here. While we're here, we can take a second to appreciate the sides. So when I was buying this, I almost thought, oh my, does that not have a pancake body? But then he sent me more photos and it's like, okay, yeah. Because that would have made it even cooler to have a non-pancake body in the pancake body era. Everything's looking good on this to me. That's just how jack plates were. They weren't quite that multiply one yet. You can see this one's actually starting to bend. My other late 74, 75 is in a little bit better shape, but if it's original, I'm not gonna mess with it. Now this ridiculously good neck. You know, I didn't notice it until I put it on the workbench here. It also has the same wood grain stuff going on as we saw on the top. Because that's something else that this could have been. Somebody could have just retopped a 74 and tried to make it special. And enough time has passed now that the blacklight test won't show us. From what I'm seeing here and how everything matches, I don't think so. But it is a three-piece neck. They have a pretty pronounced volute for this era. The mahogany neck of volutes are usually a little bit smaller. But once they start going into that maple, they tend to go a little bit crazier. Because it's like the Kalamazoo guys at first, they're like, nah, we're not putting volutes on these things. But then by the end of the 70s, they're the ones putting the most largest, obnoxious volutes. But I guess it just kind of goes back to their arch top stuffs as well. But we've got the Kluson Waffle Back tuners. Unfortunately, they don't age very well, but these ones are still kind of working. But there's our serial number of this one, 406399, made in USA. And this one was made before they had to make the distinction between the two factories with vertical and horizontal. So the 406 matches, but it's 399. So I guess I need to find 358. That's the Brazilian Rosewood top one because they deserve to be a set. And now the ever important black light test. Let's see, is it an even glow? But do keep in mind, just because you have an even glow doesn't mean it wasn't an old refinish. That's when you'd have to know these guitars. I don't have any suspicions on this. And having another vintage store check it out and also verify it, that makes me feel a little bit better because sometimes when you find something that's just this good, you gotta be careful. But I am not seeing anything that makes me suspicious. Oh, and this video doesn't really do a very good job showing you. Like there is some minor finish checking like around the neck and a little bit like on the edges of the fretboard right here. I'll show you that after the black light segment right here. Just so, you know, it's not like too perfect. But I'm not seeing anything to complain about here. Here's what I'm talking about. It's just a light shattered line right here. And what causes that is the natural movement of the wood. I don't think this one was ever like heavily dropped or anything. All said and done, this one weighs 9 pounds, 13 ounces. So just a hair under 10, which is very common for this era. But I will say, it balances nicely. I would have not have guessed it was that heavy. So let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how this one sounds.
Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not taking a pic to this guitar. It's survived this long. It, it does not need to be thrashed about, but it does deserve to be played very carefully here. <laughs> Now that we know all about this absolutely ridiculous 20th anniversary Les Paul Custom in the rare natural finish, rare crazy top, potentially made for George Harrison, probably not, but hey, who knows? At the very least, we know a certain shop got two fantastic pieces. I mean, maybe these were both destined for the NAMM show. If you were at the 1974 and or 75 NAMM show, do you remember this guitar? Because <laughs> wouldn't it surprise me if something like this was there? There's gotta be more to a story about this one because because it's just too nice. This is not the usual of what the Norlin era created. But that's what I love about the Norlin era, is you can find some crazy hidden gems if you look and search long and hard enough and you're willing to pay crazy money. <laughs> So uh, thank you to the employee at Carter Vintage that shows me all these. I was a little bit worried if all the money I was sinking into this guitar was gonna be worth it, but I would do it again in a heartbeat now that I've seen it in person. I don't know if it's the crown jewel of my collection because I've got some really nice stuff, but it is definitely in the top three. So troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed today's very special episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And hey, please share this video with somebody who you think would enjoy this. Or next time somebody says, Norlin Eric could never create anything good looking. <laughs> this one will sway them the other way. Take care. If you enjoyed tonight's episode of Abnormally Nice Norlin Era Guitars, how about you check out the Steve Howe The Les Paul? That's a really unique TLP because it still had the pancake body and transitional neck tenon.